Today is Tuesday, June 13th. And we have an announcement due to pressure from the Level 1 shareholders. Today's broadcast will not be referred to as news. Today's broadcast will simply be an information matter. Hmm. This is because of all the corrections, I think it... Played the fifth. <laughs> Did you leak the memo yourself? <laughs> you leaked the memo yourself. It was you all along. Uh, moving right along. Uh, no, you know, no horrible disaster. I mean, I, you can't like, so, okay, some things happened. And, uh, you know, it was a terroristic attack. But the British Prime Minister, Jesus, there is like, oh, let's go after a ban on encryption because of the terrorists using encryption? Wait. Yeah. No? So, well, this is an old story. We already covered this because this happened last Saturday. And uh, we talked about it. But the thing about this story is that she got reelected. <laughs> so all of the, like, oh, God, is this going to happen? Yes, it is going to happen now. They're going after the Internet. They are not backing down on this rhetoric that... Encryption is the problem. So if you're in the UK, get ready. Yeah, you probably, I mean, I don't know what to do to tell you to, it's just like the dumbest thing in the world. It's like, I mean, this is, you know, it's like in the movie Idiocracy when the corporations convince the world that Brondo is better than water because Brondo's got electrolytes. This is like that, <laughs> but the encryption version of that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's got what terrorists crave. <laughs> It definitely apparently does have what terrorists <laughs> crave. <laughs> so another feature of that, the, one of the other heads of that Hydra, is that they want faster access to your information. Not only do they want your information, but it's taken way too long for them to get your information. So they need access to every computer everywhere. This is what this is going to lead to. But for right now, it is, oh, the EU asked to expedite police requests for tech firms. So Google, Microsoft, things like that. They basically want to be plugged in directly to those companies' infrastructure to be able to do their own searching impunitively. And they want to do it across the internal borders. So it doesn't matter which country this happened in, any other country should be able to go directly to the company without discussing it with that government and get whatever they need. That's what they want here. Yeah, it's like, oh, should we not have searched all the citizens' data? Oh, well, <laughs> too late, we already did. Ah. Uh, Yes, it's fine. Yeah, so you don't even know, as the leader of your country, you don't even know when your citizens are being spied on. But in turn, you can spy on anybody else. So it's totally fair, right? I, I, I really have a problem. Like, the overall trend of this, we need to come up with a word for this because it's, it's, it's a trend of if you don't know your rights have been violated, then your rights have not been violated. And I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> well, there was that uh, when the NSA thing first happened, or maybe it was one of the FBI things, someone tried to sue them. And their argument in court was, you were not allowed to sue us because technically you should have not have known that we did this. <laughs> I don't. We reported on that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. That is that is that has been that is at the upper echelons of the court system now, and they may actually get to hear that. We don't know, but it'll be interesting. Well, here in America, we've got our own problems, and our spy chief has uh, said he's not going to say how many Americans were caught in NSA surveillance. Hint. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, previously he did when he was under fire for this whole thing. It was like, all right, look, I want to tell you who it was. Calm down. And then, you know, the short memory and the short outrage span <laughs> of America. It's like, all right, let him calm down. We're definitely not doing that. <laughs> and the reason they're giving is insane. It's like, okay, it's going to take a lot of effort to do this. And in order to do it, we'd have to take effort away from stopping those terrorists. And we cannot do that. And also, what if... Us finding out who they were somehow exposes who they were, and it gets out. It's like, <laughs> you're worried about their privacy, so you can't tell us you spied on them? Uh, uh. I don't know. The mind, the mind really reels here. The, the type of mental gymnastics. That, I mean, it's just, uh. the only fix here is for us to educate you guys on how technology actually works in hopes that there will be a balance of citizens that really understand how technology works and can see through all the BS from the politicians. And then in turn... Whenever you get to the labor camp, you spread that information to the others in the labor camp for the eventual insurrection, because it's gonna get, that's where it's going to go. Speaking of things unexpectedly sending you to the labor camp, <laughs> uh, invisible yellow dots on printouts? What? What's going on with that? <laughs> now, this is about uh, re reality winner. Reality winner. Yes, you've heard of... I don't think we covered reality winner. That happened in like a weird time, because we had to record the news early one week. 
Uh, but Reality Winter was the latest Snowden, essentially. Yeah. She leaked. Well, she's some, been arrested. We don't know. But. She leaked some documents. Well, no, well, they know that she leaked the documents because that's what got her caught. <laughs> Uh, I mean, well, but so, I mean, okay, yeah, probably, very likely the case, but, you know, maybe she just printed something and put it in the trash and it wasn't shredded properly, and so she's been, like, she, she did admitted print- to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened? Well, I think it was The Intercept. What was the paper? Yeah, The Intercept accidentally leaked the, the well, printouts. they asked for proof, and The Intercept was like, well, here's a page, explain that, and they're like, oh, we'll take this, thank you. Now, if you don't know... Every printer has a way of identifying itself on every page that it prints. And uh, it prints teeny tiny uh, dots in yellow that include a date code and the serial number of the printer. And that was enough information for the NSA to figure out who was using that printer at that time in order to figure out who printed the document. So uh, this uh, this is, you know, unfortunate because, uh, you know, whistleblower i mean this is this story is a microcosm of things that are wrong with like the whistleblowing thing in general but also shows you how little um you know journalistic like the intercept has a really good reputation but they have mishandled things from an information security standpoint and that is sad yeah i guess uh it's equally damning whether they didn't know that was a thing being someone who gets leaks from people (laughs) whose name is the intercept or if they didn't care. Now the act of putting these little yellow dots on your paper is called steganography, (laughs) which makes me think of a stegosaurus writing very beautiful handwriting. (laughs) Well, technically steganography is just embedding information, uh, in, in anything. So there's steganography and like you can have a JPEG and you can use the lower order bits of a JPEG and encode information and it's not really detectable unless you're or for it. when you take a picture with your iPhone, it <laughs> injects things that people can tell where that came from. Yeah. Oh, your devices are spying on you in, in myriads and myriads of ways, and most people don't even realize. This is crazy. Oh, and this technology, how long has it been in printers? Since 1997? <laughs> Since printers have been able to print <laughs> that small. Well, it's a milestone week for technology. The British police have used facial recognition to make an arrest for the first time. Now, they've been monitoring faces for a while now. I think they first uh, rolled it out at some kind of concert, or no, it was a maybe it was a sports event. This was a soccer match, a fairly large one. So they did the usual, you know, if you go to one of these events, your face is being recorded, and they're running it against the database of known criminals. For the first time ever, they actually caught somebody. They saw him on the tape, picked him up, and arrested him. This happened back in May. But no one could report on it because it was an active investigation. Well, now I guess he's been officially charged. Neat. It's a, it's a great day for technology, everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. Keep your head down. Uh, it's only a matter of time before these things also apply to parking fines and God knows what else. It's like, oh, you, your wheelie curb for your trash was six inches off the curb. <laughs> it's going to apply to tweets <laughs> that are critical of the government. <laughs> Uh, well, it's stacking the deck the other way. AT&T and DirecTV are facing thousands of complaints linked to overcharging and promotions, but senators are actually kind of investigating. So there's a clause in their service agreement. So when you sign up for these services, uh, you enter into what's called a binding arbitration clause, which means if you have a beef with them, rather than immediately go to lawyers, you have to go to a third-party arbitration company. Hired by them. Hired by them, yeah. Hired by the, by the company. And it turns out that third-party arbitration company doesn't really ever find <laughs> yeah, for the consumer. It always rules in their favor. So this has to do with uh, AT&T has a price lock-in policy. So it's like for two years, it's guaranteed to be these price. And people will be like, hey, it's not been two years and my price has doubled. And they're like, well, that's your new price. Deal with it. <laughs> it's and, like the mafia. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing that you agree to when you sign that contract is no class action. You are not allowed to bring class action against them. So really... There's no way out. You just pay more. And if you say, I'm not paying more, I want out of this contract, they have an early termination fee. (laughs) Yeah, enjoy your early termination fee, pleb. So this is being investigated, but there's nothing actually that has gone wrong with this. Probably what will happen Uh, is AT&T. Now, this sounds really cynical, but this is probably what will happen. AT&T will contribute to these senators' re-election funds, and then the whole thing will just go away. Or it'll be like, oh, was that wrong? Should we not have done that? It is technically legal. Yeah. Which is technically legal. That's the state that we're in. It is technically legal to break a contract as long as you let it put in the contract, hey, we're going to break this contract and there's nothing you can do about it. 
Yay, the United Corporations of America. <laughs> it's no wonder the citizenry of America is so disenfranchised, I swear. It's crazy. Uh, the Supreme Court is going to settle a major uh, cell phone privacy case. Uh, this has to do with law enforcement basically spying on you by monitoring your, like, subpoenaing you, your bills. or Well, not really subpoenaing, just getting information about your cell phone without really going through due process. Yeah, this uh, the ones that, or the one that is an actual, like the, the case that's gonna decide this is location data. So they were they suspected a guy of burglarizing places, so they went to his location data and he had been to all those places on that day or previous to those days, probably staking them out. And they said, hmm, yeah, this is our guy. So he took it all the way to the Supreme Court saying, you should not have known that. You shouldn't be able to get this information about me without a warrant, which they didn't have. Yeah, no, no warrant. But you know that never really stops anybody. No. Well, the uh, they didn't go. They don't have to go through a judge or anything. They just went to the mobile company and they're like, "Hey, we need this." And they're like, "Here you go." <laughs> now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the uh, shadow brokers and the information disclosure stuff and the Intel active management vulnerabilities in the Intel firmware. Um, because those were used by the intelligence community, but it has been leaked on the internet, and so now the bad guys are using those. Well, it turns out there are some lingering remnants of that document leak, and one of those is to be able to use an obscure feature of the active management uh, technology to establish a serial connection to uh, machines on your LAN, because you can apparently do serial over LAN, and you can use that for exfiltrating information um, undetectably. Or not really undetectably, but it flies so far under the radar of most you know, malware and intrusion detection systems that, hey, this has been spotted in the wild. And this doesn't, it's not really, you wouldn't think of this as a traditional infection or malware because it's not like taking over your machine or anything like that. It's just simply listening to what you do and sending it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can have a piece of software running on a computer that is dumping information in this like serial over LAN protocol and then have something else somewhere else picking that up. And it basically flies under the radar. I mean, uh, if you've got, you know, like a perimeter firewall or something like that, it may be detected. But any kind of firewall or monitoring on the actual individual machine, so like say your server has firewall or intrusion detection software, because this is happening outside the purview of the operating system, it's not detectable from that vantage point. Yeah, that's the terrible thing about that management engine. You really have no control over it at whatsoever. <laughs> and it has full access to everything. So if it were a printer, this would be the yellow dot <laughs> <laughs> on the page that you didn't know was there. At least you could, like, clip the borders off of your <laughs> leaked documents. <laughs> like, cut it out and then just, like, use paste. Yeah. Isn't that what, like, ransom people do? Yeah, well, they do the, they get, like, a magazine and do the individual. Because the, uh, the fonts and stuff can give you away, too. you got to be careful. <laughs> Well, in other news, uh, Mountain View, California, recently without power. Yeah, you have this drone to thank for that, or what's left of it. <laughs> it looks like at least he suffered for his crimes. <laughs> the drone flew into a uh, power transformer and knocked out power for 1,600 people. This is, uh, now this guy was near an airport, so it actually wasn't legal for him to be flying a drone there in the first place, and they are looking for him. I'm sure they'll find him, but... This could happen anywhere, and this kind of thing, it's very annoying, and I'm sure it's expensive, and he should be made to pay for the whatever he broke. But I'm sure they're going to use this as a reason to be like, hey, we got to crack down on these drones. We need <laughs> licensing, we need tracking, that kind of thing. Pretty soon we're going to be licensing and tracking all kinds of squirrels and birds and things like that, too. Because <laughs> you get those kamikaze squirrels that dive right into the Transformer. <laughs> Got to license and track all those. We need them all tagged. We need them tracked by satellites at all times. Can you imagine it's your job to track and tag squirrels? And <laughs> a little tranquilizer gun. What kind of world do we live in when we're tracking squirrels and, and you know all, all other kinds of rodentia just to make sure that they don't dive bomb into a transformer? <laughs> I mean, it's really not a lot different with the drones, but okay, whatever. Yeah, well, I, at least it doesn't seem like it was malicious. I think this guy was just a, a crappy <laughs> just an pilot. Idiot. Yeah, yeah. yeah dude. Yeah, well, of course, of course, we have to set up an entire, you know, new set of regulations and laws yeah. and things to address the idiocy of a handful of people. Although maybe just uh, some netting above the transformers, <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> Dope the wire so that it tastes bad for squirrels. <laughs> I don't know. Now we always talk about the Internet of Things and how the Internet of Things has already been co-opted by criminals and how. Uh, you know, I don't know, the baby monitor in Minnesota is DDoSing somebody in the Middle East or something. 
Well, it turns out some of those internet cameras have passwords that cannot be changed. This is, uh, what did you call the, the Chinese nephew who's doing all the software for these? <laughs> it's like, I can't remember. Uh, Hung Su or something yeah. like that. <laughs> this is uh, this is definitely the work of Hung Su. <laughs> I don't, it's, this is not malicious. This is just Chinese manufacturers are looking to make these as cheaply as possible. And on the hardware end, they're getting the, <laughs> the, the lowest of the, the cheapest contractor they can find. So I, I don't think it's that, you know, it's like, we expect, we're going to use these for a botnet and the Americans will bomb and then we'll control them. No, it's just, they didn't know what they were doing exactly. And it was easy to, it's the password is blank, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard coded as blank. And you can't change it. Why would you put a password field? <laughs> I mean, why not just leave it out? <laughs> it was probably burned into the ROM or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, probably. So well, yeah, you can, you can get into these cameras with this password field. And then there's a, another vulnerability that'll let you escalate that to give you more permission. <laughs> What really happened was uh, he sung, you know, his uncle had a warehouse full of electronics that had never been sold. Yeah. And uh, when he incorporated these, he discovered that there was only about as much CPU as a speak and spell. And so, of course, encrypting the password was just not an option with those CPUs. So <laughs> that's why we have the blank password field. Uh, it says the names of the cameras with a Opticam HD. <laughs> so if you've got an Opticam HD, people are watching. Yeah, don't don't put it on the internet. For God's sakes, don't put it on the internet. That's just really, really terrible. Uh, I wanted to think of a really clever intro for the next news story. Something <laughs> about being toxic or... Oh, how about, oops, the Russians <laughs> did it again. <laughs> oops, the Russians did it again. So Russian malware, the, the command and control structure is apparently Britney Spears' Instagram page. <laughs> so <laughs> This is not a joke. Yeah. Like, the, the, the jokes write themselves here. This is not a joke. So if you're a Russian malware maker, what you have to worry about is people tracking you down based on the command and control server, right? Because your malware has to call home, find out what to do next. You've got thousands of devices mm. participating in your botnet. How do you control thousands of devices without giving away your position? So the idea is you need a rolling moving command and control server. It has to move constantly. But then, how do you update the devices that it's moved without sending the address to the devices, which could get you caught? Well, the answer is, of course, Britney Spears' Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the most toxic Instagram on the internet. <laughs> so they used uh, extended oh characters, and the devices knew to look at... Britney Spears' Instagram. They were monitoring her Instagram at all times. And when they would find a comment that contained these characters, then certain parts of that comment could be put together and deconstructed to be the location of the new server. That's amazing. It's very clever. That's really amazing. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Theresa May wants to outlaw. So I guess we would have, <laughs> I guess we would have her thank for that. Yeah. I mean, you know. Well, but that's not encrypted. Wait. I mean, well, it's kind of encrypted, but it's not. It's in a any, cipher. I mean, you know. Well, but there's no, they're never going to catch that. It's we, not in, traditional. We've definitely seen law enforcement twist the definitions of things <laughs> well past that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that this encoding mechanism even I mean, it's 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 not quite even as as sophisticated as Rot thirteen, but I am sure that they would tack on a charge of you know using outlaw encryption if they if they you know if Theresa May's vision of this comes to life. Can you imagine them like you know Britney Spears in a little interrogation room? Like, <laughs> what like, do you? When was the last time you were in Russia? <laughs> Well, you know, the scary thing, though, is in America, if she wasn't Britney Spears, like if she was just some randomly yeah. selected person mm -hmm. on Instagram, you know, they would have her in Gitmo for the next five years <laughs> trying to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, she's just, she's she's fortunate in that no one would believe that she's any kind of like Russian malware kingpin. Although, wow, well, that would be delightful. Maybe that's what she wants us to believe. <laughs> Now, I might believe Taylor Swift is some sort of information security kingpin, but Britney Spears? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and I've got an idea for my next novelty Twitter account. <laughs> uh, Spears on malware. Yes. At, at Spears on malware. <laughs> What's happening? Uh, this is really neat. Malware is using router LEDs to steal data from secure networks. And this is a little bit of a false headline, a little bit of fake news. This is actually just security researchers like, I wonder if we could do that. And they could. <laughs> so uh, it is possible to use the LEDs on your router to air gap information <laughs> to a camera. There is actually, uh, there is a, a story um, that may have inspired the researchers from this. Uh, there was something, uh, there was a story about um, some data exfiltration 
a long time ago. They used like a, a telescope and some other stuff. I think it was the hard drive indicator, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was like an old, old, and it was so slow. It was really slow. We're talking like 300, 400 kilobytes per second. But you could actually get the information. You could reconstruct the data stream from the LED. Like that was a feature of really ancient computers. And apparently during the Cold War, America exfiltrated data that way using a telescope. I think they used that as their, you know, it's like, wow, if they can do that, imagine what we could do with a bunch of LEDs. So (laughs) the big enterprise grade switches and routers and stuff, which have tons and tons of lights, you can get pretty good speeds from those. (laughs) Yeah, just uh, flash modified firmware on there and then you're good to go. It's it's not the computers that are a danger to our, our information freedoms. It's the computers within the computers that are the danger. Well, switching gears a little bit, Tesla is going to deploy uh, upgraded superchargers that actually disconnect from the grid and are running off of solar and their battery technology. Yeah, that's so they, they've always talked about doing this, but it's like, people are like, why would you do that? Why not just, I mean, because a lot of places you can make money, you can feed back into the grid with your, why would you do that once the battery's full? Well, it turns out the reason is because somebody criticized Musk because <laughs> when you get right down to it, electric power that they're using is coming from coal in like 80% of the places. So it's not really all that clean and beautiful. <laughs> so he was wounded by that and he was like, we'll just do so later. <laughs> the sad thing is it probably wasn't an internet troll or a YouTube commenter that did that. It was probably some politician or like the president's aide or something. And he was just like, my God. You are so dumb. Let's, all right, all right, I'll buy it. I'll, I'll go with that because those are really the best kind of trolls. The trolls that don't realize that they're trolls, those are the ultimate trolls. Turns out, though, you can't do this in snowy places. So <laughs> I'm really surprised by that because I would think that the snow would be a natural solar reflector and you could just. Yeah, but the panels are just on top. Oh, so yeah. I mean, you have to put panels under the, <laughs> under the snow. I don't know really. if you could do that. Or put panels in the sky above the. It might also be a matter of them being covered up. Oh, yeah. And then you have to deal with... I'm sure you could come up with a little squeegee robot that would roll around. <laughs> uh, well, speaking... You know, we would not... It would not be the news if we did not have a story about people being replaced with technology. Yeah, this story comes to us from Boeing. Boeing is looking at replacing uh, pilots of aircraft with entirely automated aircraft. <laughs> now, this is... Uh, this is, <laughs> you know, something they're just starting on. So don't... If you're like freaking out, like, wait, what? Ro- no, no, not robot planes. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> they, yeah, they're, they're not really rolling them out anytime soon. They're just thinking like, what if? What if we could do that? <laughs> now, the critics have said, what about like, you know, the guy that landed the plane in the Hudson River? Yeah. Like, could a robot even think to do that? <laughs> That's, a lot of people are like, well, no, well, you need to pilot because sometimes crazy decisions have to be made. <laughs> and, you know, if somebody's kicking the door of the cockpit in and they're going to smash the AI, the AI can't shoot them. So, <laughs> or can it? it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so can't give it this is how Skynet was born. It's like we gave Johnny cab a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we gave it a gun to keep people out of the cockpit so that it could ram its plane wherever it wanted to ram its plane. <laughs> Uh, maybe this, maybe this is not maybe, such a maybe good a idea. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I call me a Luddite. Well, what about cargo ships? Those will be safer, right? Japan is going to launch self-navigating cargo ships by 2025. Yeah, I can't think of a good reason not to do cargo ships. I mean, because you don't have any human passengers. The worst thing that can happen is, you know, millions of dollars of stuff gets lost in the sea. But that <laughs> happens anyway sometimes. And, uh, yeah, that sounds great. They, are, they really are working on this. So they're saying 2025, you will have your first skeleton crewed <laughs> robot cargo ship. But ultimately the goal is no humans on board. So Captain Johnny Cab is bad, but uh, Johnny Cab on a boat is it's still okay. it's still be a captain. Oh, I guess he's still a captain, <laughs> ah, but he doesn't have the wings. There's no wings. <laughs> they could give him a little digital set. <laughs> huh? That's interesting. Johnny Oops, UPS. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, self-navigating ships. I'm sure that'll save a lot of money and destroy some economies. <laughs> hmm. Well, one U.S. insurer has decided that Tesla uh, needs to pay, like t- people that own Teslas need to pay higher than average premiums because of their higher than average claim rates. Yeah, this is, uh, so there's a funny thing in this article I didn't realize, but high-end cars have an 18% higher accident rate than 
middle of the road cars. Did you know that? No, I didn't realize that. And it's like, I wonder why, because they're usually built better, but and I think it's entitlement. You know, like <laughs> that whole, uh, you know, Mercedes drivers don't use their turn signal. That's been true in my <laughs> observation. Have you noticed that? So I think these Tesla assholes are just like, yeah, the laws don't apply to me, and they wreck their cars a lot. So AAA is saying you're going to pay more. I was doing some searches for this, and um, I found a couple of forum posts from the people that do body work, apparently, because people were trying to have you know sort of non-dealer people service the the body on their Teslas, but apparently whatever the body's made out of is really hard to service when you get dents and things like that in certain places. And it can cost, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to deal with some types of superficial body damage on Teslas. But I wonder if this will just push more people into the hole. Because remember Tesla's doing the uh, lifetime. Oh yeah. Like one price for lifetime insurance and service and the car. So Yeah. yeah. Uh, now's your now's your calling, Mr. Musk. Now's your calling. Just go ahead and replace the entire insurance industry. Have it all done by algorithm. Although that could bite him in the ass if you know everybody's out there just like doing their nails while they're driving their Tesla and <laughs> smashing into things. If you're watching this news program, you probably have known for the last ten years this piece of news, but we're reporting yeah. on it because well, the mainstream is finally right. Yeah, that's what was the the last thing we talked about? Oh, it was the robot, the jobs? It's like, <laughs> wait a minute. Where are all the jobs going? Robots? Who could have predicted this? Well, this this falls into that same category. <laughs> Amazingly, nobody's watching TV. Yeah, cable TV is a failing as a business, cable industry lobbyist says. So finally, people are getting the clue. Now, look at this. This, you know, if you have cable TV and you have a set-top box, it is probably a 10 or 15-year-old piece of technology. The menu yeah. interface is horrible and clunky. There are probably ads. The television shows you can watch are not indexed properly. The search function is a joke. You can't really do anything, you know, like a TV remote control is a horrible user interface. It's like we have computers now. The computers for searching and finding and playing back digital content is like akin to when TVs had like an analog knob and you'd have to like fiddle with the knob and then there was like another knob outside that knob where you'd have to like dial in the channel just the right way. Because it was like, you know, slightly out of frequency or being reflected off a barn's roof or do something. You, uh, do you remember? Now, this is going to date us horribly. <laughs> do you remember those first remote controls where they had a tether? Yeah, the tether. And they had individual switches for yeah, every channel. Yeah, yeah. And when, like, when, they upgraded the, yeah, when they upgraded the TV service to have more channels than you had switches, <laughs> <laughs> nothing you could do. <laughs> well, now I got one that had a rocker switch on the side. And so, like, you would oh. rock this, you'd rock the rocker switch and push the button, and then nah. you could rock the. So, then. we didn't have that kind of black magic. I just had, <laughs> I think ours had 15, maybe. <laughs> so, this is like trying to, you know, mandate that this, this, uh, this industry continue to live because, you know, uh, we, we need to ban the production of infrared LEDs and receivers because the people that make that tether wire are going to be out of a job. <laughs> now, they talked, one of the really telling things about this article is. This guy is the uh, head of the CEO of the American Cable Association. <laughs> That's a lobby group. So, yeah. I mean, if there's anybody who's going to try to downplay cable dying, it's this guy because <laughs> he doesn't want to tell you that. He's telling you that, you know, it's really bad. What he said was, this is why broadband is so important to our business model. <laughs> so Controlling broadband. Exactly. So when you think back to this whole net neutrality thing, a lot of, we get a lot of arguments in the comments about net neutrality. So let's just say... Net neutrality, we understand it's not perfect, and free market is better, but we are so far from free market. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the lesser two evils by a long shot. And so this guy is admitting, hey, what we had before is gone. It's We're not making money off of it. We have to get our hands around the throat of this internet because that's where the future of the money is. We must control your bits yeah. because if we control your bits, then we can make money. Look, put it to you this way. If you had no television, no media, no internet, and the only, like, I want you to think of the worst reality TV show that you have ever seen that is just, like, the most appalling example of humanity ever. And then imagine that you have no other form of entertainment at all but that and something slightly worse. <laughs> Which one are you going to watch? <laughs> this is cable TV in a nutshell. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're watching Big Mama's Family or, uh, I don't know, The Thing with Honey Boo Boo or just, I don't know, whatever the really awful reality TV shows you can think of. If you have nothing else to do, you're going to watch one of those and you're going to watch the commercials. <laughs> you want to you wanna feel old. Somebody in the comments put what year Honey Boo Boo went off the air. <laughs> and how long ago that was. Because <laughs> I bet it's been like three four years now. 
<laughs> oh lord yeah so that's that's cable it's like no you can't you can't flourish it's like read a book no that's too much work shut up <laughs> it's fine <laughs> these people want to control your media experience because there's a lot of money to be made in that and they want to keep making it they've been making that lot of money for a long time and they're not willing to give it up yeah the, the they're, they're not willing to only provide the infrastructure necessary to get on the internet because that's like a utility that's there, there's as much money to be made in providing internet access for arbitrary information not information you own uh, as much profit margin as there is in, uh, you know, like a cable or a, a water company or an electric company or something like that. There's not a lot of money to be made there. So the thing is more about control. You you know, he who controls your water supply will, you know, do all sorts of crazy stuff. I don't know. It's fine. Well, IBM and Samsung bring us Nano Sheets. Nano Sheets is a new production process, and they promise that it is going to bring five nanometer transistors. Neat. So at what, uh, 15 nanometers were on the order of 50 to 100 atoms per transistor? It's, it's, yeah, it's like a uh, 1,000 per width of the human hair at yeah. 10, I think. Yeah, so this is a fantastically small, like we're starting to run up against the limits of what you can do with, with silicon and all the doping agents that go with silicon. This is, uh, they're using uh, radiation or something to burn it in, and it's a whole new process. So... This is exciting, sure, but don't expect to see this anytime soon because it's all theoretical. Every factory would have to change everything to move to this. So eventually, yeah, it's going to be great, but for the time being, we're not going to see it. It'll be interesting to see if IBM tries to open up a uh, fabrication arm where they rent out fabrication facilities, kind of like TSMC does now. So, you know, NVIDIA and AMD and other companies like that can sort of rent out the fab from their fabrication process. IBM could do the same if they really wanted to. It's ultraviolet light, not radiation. Don't correct me in the comments. <laughs> isn't, isn't technically all of that a form of radiation? Ah. <laughs> so if you have like a really big truck with like the big diesel pipes in the back, people make fun of you say you have a small penis, right? <laughs> or you have a really high caliber gun or something like that. They're like, oh, what are you making up for? So I wonder what someone who buys a... 32.9 ratio monitor is making up for 32 by 9. <laughs> Samsung's ultra, ultra, ultra wide, double wide. Let's call this the Samsung double wide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you got to scroll down and show that picture. That is incredible. Oh. Wow, look at that. Look at that monster. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I want to know. So my first monitor was a four by three monitor and i really liked the vertical space of that four by three monitor i got a second four by three monitor and i thought that i was in heaven and then 16 by 10 came out and it was this widescreen thing and it's like 16 by 10 i, I don't i don't i have reservations about this i liked having the extra pixels on the top and bottom there's something something ain't right about this and then 16 by 9 and it's like what <laughs> there's, there's a war <laughs> Or on my vertical pixels. I need my vertical pixels as much as my horizontal pixels. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then the ultra wides came out, and it's like I don't even like. It's like I don't have room on my desk for a forty-inch monitor. But you've got a thirty-four-inch ultra wide. You do realize that's measuring diagonally, you know, from corner to corner. And a forty-inch monitor is only about an inch wider, two inches wider than a thirty-four-inch monitor. So if you've got the room widthwise, you have the height. I guarantee you that you have the height, unless you're going to run two ultra wides, one on top of each other. In which case, kudos. That's how I run but with 40-inch monitors and not 34-inch monitors because that's a thing. So what is this? This is, this is, this is crimes against humanity is what this is. <laughs> well, that's not what Samsung says about it. <laughs> they say it's an incredibly cinematic experience and that the curvature keeps everything in your peripheral vision, which if, you know, if you're going to do gaming, scroll down and show the Battlefield screenshot. Yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of cool, right? I guess uh, it's not what I want, but I'm sure some people will be into that. Who wants this? Who who wants this? What focus group is responsible <laughs> for this? Some people in the comments are going to tell you that they want it. Uh, and then, of course, they you know they say the whole like, oh, you've got two 1080 displays side by side. <laughs> Did they have a price for that thing? In the oh, fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> well, let me tell you. For $1,000, we bought a 50-inch 4K. You've, probably, you've seen it in some of the videos. And that'll give you four 1080s. It's like, it's like uh, 55, actually. It's a crossover. Oh, 55, 50, yeah. Three HDMI 2.0, two DisplayPort 1.2, 
and shipped from Korea, it was only about a thousand bucks. And it's 4K and it'll overclock to 85 hertz. It's really nice. So yeah, I, I'm not a big believer in ultra wide, but if you want ultra wide and you really want ultra wide, Samsung's got you covered. So riddle me this, you ultra wide users. If you really like ultra wide, why couldn't you just run with black bars on the top and bottom with something like the crossover 55? I mean, if you like the extra <laughs> field of view and you want to see more stuff, why, why not run with black bars when, <laughs> when you need to do that? Uh. <laughs> Riddle me this, Batman. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we've got some more technology news. So this is DeBauer. If you haven't heard of him, he's a sort of a a famous modder uh, overclocker, and he developed the tool for delitting Skylake CPUs, which really helps them overclock. And so he's gotten his hands on a bunch of the 10-core Skylake parts. Now, officially, all the Intel stuff is under NDA until June 19th. I'm not saying anything at all. I'm just telling you, you should go read this. It's kind of interesting. But the video that he has here, I want to call a special attention to, because he says in that video that the 10-core is overclockable to 5 gigahertz. And it's like, ooh. That sounds pretty good. However, delitting is necessary to do that, and the particular CPU that he was using was super handpicked, and he thinks is super, super cherry and not representative of a typical 10-core um, Skylake example. So 10 cores at 5 gigahertz is, is not really realistic, although he was doing that on an all-in-one liquid cooler, a Corsair, looked like a, an H115 GTX or something like that, uh, but it was delitted, which will destroy your warranty. Oh. And possibly your CPU. <laughs> and that'll cost you a thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. A thousand dollar CPU, you're gonna, you know, buy a, a you know, a tool to to delit it and do the other thing and whatever. So it doesn't really say anything about the stock clocks and things like that. I think Intel published the uh the stock clocks before. Um, so that's a thing. Maybe it suggests that the eight core will be a little bit more overclockable. In the video he suggests that if you've got a really, really good CPU, you might hit four point eight or four point nine with the integrated heat spreader, maybe 4.9, realistically, you know, 4.7, 4.8 um, on on all 10 cores, which honestly is not bad. I mean, the, that's a, that's a clock speed advantage. Wasn't the turbo like 4.4, 4.5 with the, just the natural turbo? For the information that has been published on other websites, that's what it looks like. So really, you're talking about, you know, getting 0.4, wasn't, didn't uh, AMD do like 0.3 over mm -hmm. an overclock? So it's getting kind of close actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have every reason to believe that Threadripper is going to have the same 4.1 gigahertz hard ceiling um, that everything else does. But still, if you had like a 12 core that's doing 4.1, which is uh, one of the leaked specs for Threadripper, uh, it's going to give Intel a run for its money, I think. I mean, consider that before this on X99, even in the Xeon platform, even when you're paying $7,000 per CPU in the server space, you did not see four gigahertz anywhere in the Xeon lineup. And all of a sudden, we've got all kinds of parts that are more than four cores and more than four gigahertz out of the box. That's, I think that tells you something about the marketing and uh, the, uh, you know, stratification of the marketplace and how Intel was sort of, you know, playing the game there with marketing. I don't know. In other CPU news, Intel has fired an interesting warning shot across the bow of uh, Microsoft and Qualcomm. I don't know if you call it a, a warning shot. I mean, it was very vague. It was like, hey, remember what we did to the people that tried to do this before? <laughs> <laughs> Referring to Transmeta, of course. So what we're talking about is the uh, these new Windows on ARM is going to have full x86 emulation. So you're actually going to have Windows on ARM that can run any of the old apps. Yeah, the full backstory here is that Intel historically uh, has not really been great about power management on x86. Uh, Intel has had a lot of, of near misses uh, with partners that have been really frustrated with Intel's lack of power efficiency. Most famously is probably the MacBook Air. The original MacBook Air was very almost an AMD processor because of power efficiency on, on, the, on Intel's side. Well, you know, that's basically true of tablet computers as well. Intel has tried to produce Atom CPUs that are relatively low power. There have been a few phones that have been based on x86. I picked up some of them. And, you know, everything across the board with those is lackluster battery life. ARM has been superior for longevity, battery life, things like that. Microsoft tried doing Windows on ARM, and that was basically a failure. So Microsoft and Qualcomm, not really ready to throw in the towel, not really ready to give up. 
ARM processors increasing in complexity um, toward their x86 counterparts, because x86 CPUs are ludicrously complicated anyway. Microsoft actually recently showed off uh, a tablet that was running Photoshop for x86 competently on an ARM processor. And so the ARM processor has gotten to a point where it's doing enough either in hardware or software or a combination to emulate Intel's x86 instruction set architecture. The interesting thing here is that technically today we're running AMD 64, which is actually AMD's um, instruction set architecture, even on the Intel side of things. Because if you remember, Intel came up with their own 64-bit architecture, which everybody pointed and laughed at and was ultimately a horrible failure. They had the Itanium, which was their take on 64-bit, and that became known as the Itanic in the industry. That failed spectacularly. That was a that was a, that was the that was a boondoggle that spent more money than AMD's net worth. That should tell you something. So, uh, you know, that sour grapes a little bit. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's a really, you know, sort of airing of the dirty laundry here a little bit. But uh, Intel has, has, has sort of said, you know, we don't really like people using x86 other than us and, and I guess grudgingly AMD. So it's going to be interesting to see how this shakes out once these products are available. And I think these products are, are imminently... Uh, nearing release, like the, the release is imminent for these particular products. If Qualcomm's legal department wasn't already earning every cent that I get paid <laughs> with the Apple front, now they're going to have to open up an Intel front. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I don't know. It's going to be really, I can't wait to see how this plays out. This is going to be really nice. Kind of related, Apple is doing some stuff with, with AMD and x86. The first thing we'll mention is iFixit did a teardown of the new 21.5 Retina 4K uh, iMac, and they found that it's actually upgradable. Unlike previous models, you can replace the CPU and the RAM and a whole bunch of other things if you're willing to tear this thing basically down to the frame, which is good for repairability and upgrades, I guess, although the faint of heart is not going to upgrade it. And I also uh, I saw some stories about how it was closer in value to, like if you go part by part, you're actually not getting a terrible value. And it hurts me to say that about Apple because <laughs> you know I don't I don't like Apple, but it does seem like they're getting close. Now, you st it still was like four grand. Yeah, for, for the iMac Pro. So it's still an insanely expensive <laughs> computer, but they are giving you quality components yeah. and features for that for once. Well, the iMac that I fixed it tore down, I think, was like the twelve or $1,300 model. So it was like the, the lowest end new version that they could actually take apart and do stuff with. But hey, it's upgradable. So that's really, <laughs> really good. Maybe that's where they're getting their margin. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is that um, there has been an Intel part show up with an AMD GPU. Now, this is all rumor and innuendo, and there are certain sites on the internet that would have us believe that Intel and AMD are producing a single package, a single unit, a single chip that has an Intel component and an AMD component, like as if it is a partnership. But I'm going to weigh in here and say I don't think that's what it is. I don't think it's Intel and AMD working together. I think the story here is probably that... that uh, Apple is, because Apple is using Radeon GPUs for a lot of their stuff now because of the performance in Vega. We saw the Vega announcement. I think that Apple has probably asked Intel and AMD to work together on a power-efficient laptop. And so a CPU, has a, a device, I should say, has shown up in online benchmarks that seems to have an Intel CPU and seems to have Vega-like stream processors. And so it might, it might possibly be something on one package, we know from a couple of years ago that Intel was working on a process where they would provide a carrier and a CPU and you could add other silicon to the package. And so this is not unlike some of the very small USB flash drives where Fison or somebody like that provides a USB controller and somebody else can provide the flash chips, but it's all packaged in one unit. So Intel may be working on or perfecting a manufacturing process where they provide a certain type of CPU that actually has a socket for more silicon that somebody else can add stuff to later. So not really a partnership between Intel and AMD, but Intel and AMD working together on a new type of CPU product. I don't know that for sure though, that's just a guess. But we'll see how good of a guess that is, for this reason. So that's probably a, something for a power efficient MacBook or something like that with a high speed interconnect between CPUs. I don't know, could be good. Got a lot of AI news this week. Are you lying about your identity? Artificial intelligence can now tell. We, we can't roll this out at the borders fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea here is to look at your mouse movement. And so what they did was they took some people and they 
sort of trained them. It's like, okay, this is your fake identity. Learn it and be ready to regurgitate all these things. <laughs> and then they took people who were actually real. I, that was their identity. And they sat them down and they ran them through these questions. But they didn't give the fake identity people all the information. In some cases, they gave them information that they would have to extrapolate. So like, what's your birth sign? Well, you know your birth date, but who has immediate recall of like, oh, this date is Scorpio, you know? <laughs> so by tracking the mouse movements when they hit those difficult questions and had to think and calculate, they were with very high accuracy able to tell who was not the real person. <laughs> Yay, AI. Yeah, this is going to be rolled out at the border. Like, it's, it's going to be great. <laughs> you're going to sit down and you're going to have an interview with a robotic border agent, and they're probably going to give you prescription antidepressants by the time it's over. That's going to be, like, the, the worst kind of CAPTCHA. Because, like, some people are just going to be, like, freaked out and nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Not be, and they're going to get flagged as identity thieves and locked up. <laughs> Maybe you can fake being like elderly or slightly scatterbrained or something to get uh, out of that. It's like, I don't know what's happening. I have a, yeah, I have a card from my doctor. <laughs> well, if you're suicidal, it'll be able to detect that too. So yeah, artificial intelligence can now predict suicide with remarkable accuracy. This is uh, machine learning. So they taught their AI with it, just pure medical information. Like what they came to the hospital for what drugs they were on, their vitals, their medical history. And then they, after they taught it, they 5,000 people, they ran through the machine learning. And then it had like 90%. 80 to 90% accuracy. It was nine, And then they had a eight to nine month window and a two week window. It was more accurate at the two week window yeah. of guessing who was going to kill themselves. Yeah, this is really, really uh, interesting and, 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 and probably good for the future of medicine. But I don't know, it's... It's very intrusive. Yeah. And of course, the first thing that comes up here is insurance. Can you imagine how quick your insurance company would drop you? <laughs> I, mean, I don't think suicide is covered, but I, I don't know. And it's also important to note these people didn't uh, go to the hospital for like attempted suicide or anything like that. Suicide wasn't necessarily part of their medical history. It's just the pattern that the machine learning found. It wasn't clear to me if the psychological component, like psycho psychological uh, mental health screening or anything like that, was a part of their health screening either, a part of their, their patient records. Because here in America, we don't those, those yeah. aren't even the same thing. I, one of the big things was uh, melatonin. Is it melatonin or melanin that makes you sleep? Melatonin. Melatonin. If they were on a melatonin uh, prescription, that was a huge waiting factor. Because if you can't sleep right, you're way more likely to kill yourself. <laughs> Oh, God, that's probably not good. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe cut back on the tea. <laughs> but I like the caffeine and the coffee, and I just, I don't know. Well, if, if it ever becomes ashes in your mouth, and you're just like, there's no reason to drink the tea, then you've got to worry. <laughs> in order for me to be on top of my game and play around on those battlegrounds, I need at least three <laughs> cups of coffee. And God just... knows we're on top of our game. <laughs> Uh, you can pick up this lovely shirt at the level one store. Yeah, that'll, that'll, you know, I don't know. AI is also doing brain scans. Now, this one is they're predicting autism based on infant brain scans. So I wonder what the AI is seeing in the brain scans. Because well, this one's also working really well. Well, this was another machine learning. So they took all these infant brain scans that they had and fed it through. And they were like, here's who turned out to have autism. Again, amazingly accurate. Now, this one is better at telling you that your child will not have autism. 100% hmm. successful. But, of course, you know, that's like, I don't know what percentage have autism. So it's like probably pretty easy to be like, oh, yes, this <laughs> one's fine. But in the ones that it was worried about, I think like 80% of those turned out to be yes. Yeah. So uh, another incredibly accurate AI. Now, this one is terrifying in terms of insurance. Yeah. Because... When you're born, <laughs> you might get a red mark next to your name. It's like, nope, we're not touching this one. Oh, man, that's just, there's so many dystopian things you can come up with because, you know, you can uh, get an infant's DNA, you know, in, in utero, I guess, or in vitro, or I don't know what that is, before they're born. And uh, <laughs> being able to read their DNA before they're born, you know, even if you're not manipulating the DNA, is like, oh, no, this one's not good enough. Reject. Let's, oh, let's try again. It's funny you mention that because uh, we never covered it, but... In Finland, they just celebrated that a 0% Down syndrome births. Wow. And that's not because nobody had a, you know, conceived a child with Down syndrome. It's that they are that good at finding it now. And they wow. terminated all those pregnancies. Wow. But a lot of people are arguing. It's like, well, 
you're kind of euthanizing people with Down syndrome. And it's like, isn't that a good thing? I, I don't know. If you ask me, it is. But at the same time, are people with Down syndrome not happy? You know, they seem happy, some of them. So <laughs> these are probably more difficult questions. Yeah. This <laughs> <to, laughs> ab is above our pay grade. <laughs> but it's the same kind of thing. Like, we have the ability to stamp these things out, but do we have the authority? Well, switching gears, uh, GameStop apparently had malware on their servers for like a year. Yeah, if you're a console pleb <laughs> and you've been playing console games instead of Player Unknown's Battleground, which is <laughs> the only game to play, then uh, you might want to check your email. GameStop might have let you know that your identity has been stolen. I remember when GameStop had a PC game section. <laughs> Pepperidge Farms remembers. I remember when any game store, had a, <laughs> anybody other than Steam sold PC games. GameStop was a great place to get the Lucasfilm games, LucasArts games or whatever. Those were really, like the point-and-click adventures. I always had, you know, one that I hadn't played. I was like, ooh, I'll save up and get that one. But Yeah, nope, no more. And malware. Yeah, there was, wasn't there one guy that had gotten like six or seven? I, I found a different story that uh, there was like one guy that had six or seven credit cards in a year. And it turned out that it was GameStop because he bought stuff from GameStop every week. And it's like, who is stealing my credit card every time? That was, it was GameStop. Wow. So yeah, that was that was neat. Traditional sports have an esports problem, according to this. Yeah, turns out millennials. There's a lot of. Uh, did you see McDonald's released a report and it's like, why is McDonald's doing bad? And they were like, it's the millennials. <laughs> <laughs> they won't eat our food. Well, the millennials also. It turns out they don't really watch regular sports. Actually, they do, but as opposed to earlier generations, it is a. 11% or 12% abstain, 40% and 48% split between esports and real sports. I've never, under, I, I know some people that are like really huge basketball fans and I've never understood the, the behavioral display there when whenever like the <laughs> yeah. basketball stuff is going on like i just i don't get it it's like why are you this excited about this <laughs> i don't do that with esports either but it's just like yeah i i don't, i haven't gotten into esports at all but I'm not crazy about regular sports either. Now, both, I can see the appeal of, like, watching a competition. There is something a little bit entertaining. I mean, I'll watch football and basketball and be like, hey, that's an impressive thing those people are doing. And I'll watch Dota, and I'll be like, oh, wow, look what they did. That's impressive. I don't care, but I can respect it, I guess. I don't know. I see things on TV, and those people, like, you can take it too far. Well, no, I'm not talking about the fans. Oh, okay. I'm talking about the players. I like how, here's my favorite thing about sports fanaticism. It's like, you don't like sports, so you're gay. <laughs> but so the person telling me this has another man's name written across his back. <laughs> well, maybe we can rely on Apple to tell us what's objectionable from now on, because they're <laughs> Do you think, doing that. You think Apple prefers esports? <laughs> I think Apple prefers whatever makes them money. I think esports probably. <laughs> no, I guess you would never esport. There is no esport that takes place on Apple, is there? Uh -uh. Wow, that's something for you, right? Yeah, that might be changing because they're they're getting a graphics card worth a damn in the iMac. So maybe we'll see. <laughs> yeah, but young kids coming up in the esports scene, it's like I don't have any money. I got to put together a machine. <laughs> I ain't gonna be buying apples. <laughs> no scrapyard wars uh, for the uh, you know like scraping together an iMac. Maybe a Hackintosh, but uh, I don't think that would be tournament legal. <laughs> you could play StarCraft. StarCraft Two was available for Mac. So that was the last good game available for Mac, I think. But yeah, this story is uh, kind of depressing. Of course, uh, was it two weeks ago we learned of the death of poor Pepe the frog. Oh, yeah. We're, we haven't even told people what, what Apple is helping us out with. It's uh, oh, yeah. Pepe is banned from the Apple App Store, so <laughs> you can't have applications that feature uh, Pepe. Actually, Apple did a whole bunch of revisions to the App Store. Uh, one of the other things that they revised in apps is now developers must use the iOS API for calling to ask for a rating because a lot of apps were... Uh, so shall we say aggressively asking for a rating, which helps drive the rating up in the, yeah. in the rankings in the, in the App Store. So now... You, if you're going to do that, you have to use Apple's API, and they can keep an eye on how often your application is doing that and how aggressively and control it. Yeah, so the Pepe game, they felt that Pepe represents, you know, racism or whatever. He's political <laughs> extremism. Now, this app, did you look at the app? The app is hilarious. The app is about the 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 re the Pepe so the <laughs> autistic screeching, so you have to scream at your phone to control Pepe and scroll up a little bit. 
The point system is tendies. <laughs> Chicken tendies. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a work of art that is being suppressed. I mean, is this, is this what we have really come to as a society that we must suppress certain kinds of artwork? This is this is a, this is a masterpiece. Now, I would like to call out to 4chan and the people because <laughs> no, cause don't invoke the 4chan. I'm I'm not saying I'm not asking them to do this. I'm giving them a an idea. Because Pepe, you know, they did that sort of as a joke. It's like, could we really get Pepe turned into a horrible alt right? <laughs> like, could we make him a character of hate? And they could. The answer is yes. <laughs> so I would say, start using the Apple logo. <laughs> hey, if you could get that turned into a, a hate icon, can you imagine how great that would be? Or a Tim Cook caricature. Oh, there's a lot of ways you can go with that. I'm not, you know, be creative, but I'm just saying. <laughs> They're insanely creative. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of the news. This is not good. We, we're ending on a note involving 4chan. This is not good. <laughs> but <laughs> that, very bad. I mean, more, get, if you're an app developer, count your points and tendies. That is genius. Look at that. Look how hilarious Just, that is. <laughs> uh, well, I don't even. So, yeah. And screaming re at your phone. Now, if you see somebody screaming re at their phone on the uh, subway, you know what they're playing. Well, but they're not playing it. It's not you can't get it. I wonder if it's going to be like like uh, Flappy Bird or some of those other games where you could buy a phone that had that app pre-installed from before it was banned, and they go for like ten thousand dollars on eBay. Or maybe you think Google Play would take it? <laughs> Probably. I don't think Google Play cares. I'm sure you could get it on Steam. Yeah, yeah. Steam Greenlight. Whatever. You'd have to have a good microphone though. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next week. Yep. See ya.